So just to let everybody know, we're recording this and we are hoping that it will go onto our YouTube channel. So then I will do the formal introduction now for Chris, who's come back again to do GAM for us a couple of times. This is a very popular course. And so it's really good to see you all here today. And I'm going to pass over to Chris to explain more about <laughs> the course. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Bainey. Um, I am the head data scientist with Birmingham and Solihull ICB. Um, and this morning, um, we're going to walk through um, a lot of the theory and application behind simple generalized additive models or GAMs. So I may abbreviate it to GAMs for a lot of the rest of the day. Um, I will just walk through in a minute where the material is, how to get access to it, um, and how we can move on. Um, Zoe, do you, could I ask you just for a minute or two to fly any chat comments, comment there from Raj, if that's all right? Yeah, I'm just um, it. We are recording today, so um, if you don't want to be on the recording, forgive me, I'm not entirely sure how it works from the recording perspective. I presume the mini um, people will be there, visible to everyone. So if you prefer not to be on the recording, no, is that not right? Okay, so I was going to say you can turn your camera off. Just the speaker. So I Just will speak here now and okay. the slides, but if you do speak, obviously your words will be on there. But if you wanted anything to be cut out at any point afterwards, even if you kind of go, oh yeah, I'd like this, just let us know and we can do some editing in the background for it. Thank you. Um, questions at any point is, is totally fine. Um, do please, if you can, uh, unmute yourself and say it because I find it a little bit hard trying to fly the chat um, whilst I'm also looking at another screen. So it's a little bit easier. Um, if you're able to, to say it to me, because it interrupts me enough that I can focus on you, um, that would be great. Um, and I will say, um, without wishing to sound too full of myself, today is quite tricky, um, and it relies on you having a background where you have some understanding of uh, regression modeling, specifically the linear model, uh, and we're going to be relating stuff to the generalized linear model a bit later. Um, that was kind of in the blurb about the course. So um, without wishing to make anyone panic too much, I'm hoping you have enough regression about you that we can uh, hang everything off that. Um, I will run through some of it as well at the start, just to, to give a grounding. But it is um, fairly important for you being able to pick things up and um, that you at least have a, a bit of the linear model uh, in your head. Um, the point of generalized additive models here, we're going to be using them in an explanatory, uh, sorry, not in an explanatory, in a predictive context. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what I wanted to say. So the point of these models really is we're less concerned about um, the strength of individual predictors, and it's more about finding a functional form for each predictor that allows us to make the best predictions. It's actually surprisingly similar to a lot of the stuff that goes on with the likes of neural networks or things where we have complex functions transforming stuff so you get the best predictive outcome. I would say that GAMs fall nicely in the middle where you have a combination of interpretability um, along with um, some flexibility, um, but hopefully that will come out as we go. So let me just share my screen um, and I will point us uh, in the direction of uh, some of the materials so we can get that set up. So I'm going to be working in my own local R Studio um, instance here. Um, I do have the slightly annoying um, Zoom window popping up from time to time. So if I'm faffing around with the top of the screen for a second, just forgive me. Um, so all of the material is published on GitHub here. Um, so we've dropped the link in the chat. So that should be available to you um, to see that. Um, if you can go to this link, for those of you who know what you're doing with GitHub, um, please go ahead and clone this repository um, and then open it up, preferably in RStudio, so you can work through the material. Because what we're going to do is we're going to follow through some pre-prepared scripts rather than coding from scratch. If you're not familiar with Git and GitHub, don't worry. That doesn't price you out of this. Um, you can get access to this material quite easily. And the way to do that is to, uh, once you've followed this link, if you click on the green code button, you'll see some stuff appear underneath. Uh, these are the addresses for people who want to clone it for, um, uh, for, for using Git. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, you can follow down to this bottom option here and click Download Zip. And clicking on that, it will download this entire repository as a zip file. Um, and you can then open that up in your downloads, extract it to somewhere. 
I'm just going to leave it in my downloads here. As you can see, I have to use a remote desktop a lot and I have to download it regularly. Um, so once you're in there, you can then open it up. And if you open up the R Studio project, it will take you to a, a, a working instance with all the various files connected up. So just to repeat that um, for ease, if you follow our link to um, the GitHub repository, if you know what you're doing with Git, click on the green link here and use this address here to clone the repository down onto your machine and open it up. If you're not familiar with Git or you don't have it installed, if you click on download zip, that will download everything in a zipped file into your downloads location and you can unzip it and then open it from there. So what you're aiming for is to open it up into RStudio and this is my local instance of RStudio um, and it should look something a bit like this. So in my bottom right Explorer window here, you can see the folders that are present on GitHub. And the things that we're most concerned with today are this folder called scripts here, and that's what we'll be working through. So once you clone this down or downloaded or unzipped it, if you can click into scripts, uh, we have a number of different exercises. So we'll definitely go through one, two, and three. Four is a little bit trickier, uh, and depending on how we're going, because I, I will uh, ask for your feedback on a few occasions to see uh, how everyone's coping with things. Um, we'll we'll pick on some of four. Four is some slightly more advanced bits, uh, and five is a try it all out exercise for you to apply the stuff that you've learned. So if we've got enough time to try that in the session today, we will. Um, if we haven't, then you can have a go at it at your leisure. Uh, and there's also a version of it where I've tried to have my best go at it as well. So you can either step through it and see what how I've approached it, or you can try and approach it yourself and then and then see uh, see if you can do better. See you build a better model. Um, because all models are wrong, so, you know. Um, got a couple of things in the chat. Just having a quick look there. Oh, thanks, Zoe, for he helping out on that. Appreciated. OK, so once you've got that open, so what we'll be going through is we'll go through these exercises. But I will step through some slides first and give you a little bit of context. So if you're still uh, in the process of downloading, don't worry. Um, you can just finish that off in the background whilst I start this. And forgive the terrible joke, but I've got to try and get one in somewhere, right? Um, so what we're doing today is we're looking at modeling nonlinear data with generalized additive models. And what I mean by nonlinear data is that we can't draw an easy straight line through the relationship between two variables. Uh, it's something a bit more complex. I'm sure there's better definitions than that, but I'm going to use slightly woolly definitions today because I hope they communicate the thing better. So just to back up a second, regression model. So what is a regression model? So um, I hope this is all familiar to everyone, but I just want to kind of reiterate it so we can build on top of it. So we're trying to predict one variable, so y that we've got here on this axis, uh, using another variable, x that appears to show some relation to it. So I think you can see there that as X increases, Y in general increases. And it's actually a pretty good relationship here because it's forming quite a nice line across it. So you could probably agree that if we found a way of drawing a line of best fit, it might look something like that. And that's exactly what the linear model is. It's the equation of a straight line, for those of you who might remember that in uh, the kind of high school maths and stuff. So what we're doing here is we're describing this line in terms of a couple of things. So firstly, where does the line start, the alpha or the intercept? So when our variable is 0, what's the starting value of y? And then for each unit of y, so 1, 2, 3. So for a unit of 1 on x, sorry, for a unit of 1 on x, how much does y increase? And this is my first beta here. So a beta is what we're going to call a coefficient, a regression coefficient. So it's something that we multiply one of our variables by to get our answer. And when you write that out in an equation, what we've got here is y equals the intercept plus however many times x plus some error, because as you'll notice, these points don't all line up directly across this line. And the error is the remaining distance from these points to the line 
or the so-called residual error. So you might hear the term residuals used a lot. Um, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the remaining error after we've fitted our, our line. Um, so you could probably see, and if you squint hard enough, you could probably see that actually this line is generated based on um, a, a, a nice uh, kind of easy regression with some noise added. So I've got an intercept here of two, and then for each unit of x, it, y is increasing by 1.5. So the regression equation here becomes an intercept of two plus a coefficient of 1.5 times x. So if I was predicting from any value of x, I could work out what y is by having two plus 1.5 times my x. And that would be a reasonable prediction. So that's how we're using it. We're using it less to explain, but more just to predict what the outcome is. But what about something that's a little bit more complicated? So you can see kind of broadly here again with X and Y, we've sort of got a similar thing here where broadly as X increases, Y increases, but it's not quite as neat as previously. So we've got kind of hole just here and you can see where it sort of advances both above and below. Um, and then we've kind of got almost a bit of a break point there where it suddenly it's a bit higher, um, but it looks more like a sort of sigmoid, doesn't it? More like an S. So what are your options here? So firstly, you could just fit what we've just done before. You could just fit a straight linear model through it. Um, and remember, harking back to that, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, this might be useful enough for you for the purposes of what you want, and that's fine. But if you're being critical of it, you could say, um, say for this portion here, actually, it's quite a bad fit because really all of my data points are above this line between 100 and 150. Um, so it's really quite bad for that portion of the fit. And if I was to look between 50 and 100, actually, so for 50 to kind of 75 range, it's actually kind of a bad averaged fit of a, a sort of a below and above. So it's it's fine. It's an average fit. Maybe we could do better. So one of the next things we commonly do is split things into categories. So maybe we categorize X into a few different variables and we say where X is 50 or below. Uh, where x is 150 to 51, or where x is 151 upwards, for example. But what you're really doing here is you're fitting a series of small means. So you're saying everything from 150 onwards has this mean. Everything between 50 and 150 has that mean. And everything from 0 to 50 has this mean. So whilst it is a little bit more flexible, it's actually quite blunt within its categories. So if I split X up into three categories here, yes, it works, but you could question whether or not it's that much better than fitting a, a line of best fit straight through it. Uh, it may or may not be. It's probably very dependent on your data set. But maybe we could do something a little bit better. So what I've done here is I've applied a, a polynomial to X. Well, I'll say some more about that in a second, but that allows the fit of, um, the fit to y to flex and I think you'll agree that probably for the most part that is a better fit across the range you know with some some areas where it's not than either of the first two options if we stack them up against each other that's kind of roughly what they're doing so if you fit a linear model you'll be getting the uh, bluey uh, turquoisey thing if you fit categorical predictors you'll be getting the yellow and if you fit something with a, a reasonable polynomial you'll get something more like the red so there's different options to fit the same data, even within the linear model. So poly what? So I said polynomial a second ago. So uh, for those of you who are really good at maths, and although I'm doing something kind of complex and mathsy today, I'm actually not maybe the most adept at the theoretical side of it. So apologies for that. Some of you are probably a heck of a lot better and could give me a better definition of a polynomial than I ever could. But what I mean here is um, fitting things with powers. So we might fit x plus x squared plus x cubed, etc. And because they are a different shape and a different function, you would have a coefficient for each one. You'd have a coefficient for x, a coefficient for x squared, a coefficient for x cubed. And that allows you to boost certain parts of the fit and to bend the fit, if you like. So that's kind of what we see here. So we have different portions of the fit um, because they're boosted by different parts of the polynomial terms. So that might sound a bit woolly, but hopefully you can see um, that there's some legs in this. So if you fit something and you want to fit uh, to flex that fit, maybe you could try fitting x and x squared and x cubed, and that will go quite a long way to fixing some of it. There are a few issues, though. 
um, the more complex you get, so the more, um, the, the higher the power. So if you go up to kind of lots of, you know, sort of to the power four, five, six, 20, et cetera, it can get quite crazy because although the term works well in the middle, it tends to go a bit crazy on the extremes because they're fixed on the, the external points of your data, on the range of your data. So um, it's a thing called Runge's phenomenon. And if you're interested, you can go and look that up. That's a link to the Wikipedia page here. But they, the, the higher the order of the polynomial, the, the crazier it gets at the edges, essentially. Quick segue into a couple of things you need to know when we're talking about some of the things today. So you might also see when you're looking at regression models and indeed statistical tests in general, uh, you might have heard the phrase degrees of freedom. It's one of those lovely kind of very clear descriptively named some things that doesn't tell me what the heck it is. So it is exactly what it's named exactly what it is. Um, but what that means in context to me is that how much of my range of whatever I'm looking at is actually free to vary and how much of it is fixed. So um, in my example that I've got on the slides here, let's imagine that um, you've got a system and you know the average. So we've got three numbers and we know that the average of these is five. So of my three numbers now, how many of them are free to vary? Well, actually only two, because if I vary the two of them, but I know the mean's five, that means the third one has to be fixed because it has to be whatever number resolves it, so the mean's five. So although I've got three numbers, I've got two degrees of freedom because one of them is fixed because of the fact I've got a known outcome. So the reason that this is important is that when you're building the smoothers and the more complex things that we see in a bit, you sometimes describe them in terms of the number of degrees of freedom. And sometimes you need more degrees of freedom or fewer degrees of freedom to either make a smoother, um, uh, kind of straighter and flatter or more wiggly. And believe it or not, wiggly is the, the term used in the literature. Um, so in general, we're talking about models here that are constrained, uh, constrained at least to a small degree. So here it's N. So if N is our number of, uh, is our number of numbers, our number of data points, um, we're constrained to N minus one degrees of freedom in this particular example. So as I said, then in a regression, we're normally constrained by the number of data points that we've got. So you might have seen in regression tutorials where if you've only got 20 data points and someone wants to throw loads of predictors in, someone pipes up going, oh, that's bad, you haven't got enough degrees of freedom. Um, you haven't, you're limited by the number of data points. Now there are tricks to get around that with some of the higher dimensional models, but that's not what we're doing today. Um, so usually we're concerned about the number of predictors we've got in our model versus the total number of data points that we've got. And if your outcome is binary, we're even more concerned because you, you're interested in how many you've got in the positive and negative cases. But the upshot of this is that we normally refer to the number of degrees of freedom here in this context as K and our total number of data points is n. So our models in a regression context are n minus k, but we've also got that minus one constraint from the system that was described above. So if I have 20 data points and I have two predictors, so I've got 20 minus two minus one, the 17 degrees of freedom in that, uh, residual degrees of freedom left in that model. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a, a, one of the many areas today that's kind of fairly deep waters if you get into it. And there are probably people again who could give you a better description of that. But suffice it to say that the degrees of freedom are important for defining how wiggly it's possible for our smoothers to be. And another concept that's important today um, is overfitting. So you may or may not have known of overfitting. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to fit a model that describes a system fairly well. Overfitting is um, fitting a model too specifically to your training data that it goes beyond the general relationship and it actually models quirks and weird things about your specific subsample. So what we're trying to do is generalize to the general relationship between, I don't know, uh, age and mortality rate, not the very specific example of age and mortality rate in the sample you took. So you're trying to use your sample to generalize to the whole population if you like. So the overfitting in general, we want to try and avoid, and there are ways to try and do that. 
uh, and that then allows us to have a more generalizable uh, model. Oh, sorry, I just knocked backwards. Um, so, and this is just a sort of thought experiment here. Um, we're going to look at knot points later on um, in our, on our smoothers. If um, I'd consider you to think as we go through that, if I was to put a knot at every data point, what would happen? Because that's one of the ways you can do a smoother. Okay, doke. So I've talked about you for quite a bit. Um, so I will give you plenty of breaks later on, but we'll do a couple of exercises and then a break, and then a couple of exercises and a break. Um, so what we're going to do now is go straight over to our studio and go through some of the examples. So hopefully you've been able to download uh, everything that you need. So just as a reminder, again, if you go to GitHub and you click on the green button, you can either clone it or you can download the zip and unzip the file and reuse the file from there. So what we're looking to do is open up into our studio and in your, uh, your file explorer, there's a folder called scripts. So in scripts, we're gonna go through these exercises in order. So we're gonna start with exercise one. Uh, I've boosted my text a little bit here um, so forgive me if it's a little bit busy going on the screen, but hopefully you can see it. Um, what I have done is I've tried to comment the scripts quite a lot. Um, so the comments should relate to the things that are immediately below them. So you should be able to, at a, another time, come back and read the script through and follow the order of what we're doing without it being linked to me yakking at you for, um, for a long time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a, a demonstration data set. And this is a deliberately overly simple data set because these are very complicated models. The more complicated we go, the easier it is to miss the, some of the fundamentals. So we're picking up uh, a data set from Cancer Research UK, um, which is for osteosarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer. And this is interesting because it doesn't have the usual age profile of many a tumor. Um, most uh, instance tumors uh, sort of increase fairly linearly with age or there's a step at a certain age and it goes up quite a lot. This actually has a peak in uh, late teens, early 20s, and then it um, subsides and then it goes up again with age. So it actually has a more complicated relationship. So we'll see this as we go through. Uh, so first of all, um, we're going to use MGCV package and we're going to use Tidyverse. So hopefully you've got those installed. If you haven't, uh, I'd encourage you to install the things as you go. Uh, MGCV comes as part of Core R, so you will have that. But we'll also use a couple of other packages, and I'll give you enough warning to install them. But uh, those packages are Gratia, G-R-A-T-I-A, -A, um, and MGCVIS. So let me just show you how you'd install those. So in the Tools, Install Packages. So you want Gratia, G R A. TIA and MGC viz. And these are just slightly nicer plotting views uh, that someone who uses GAMS a lot has put a package together because they've thought about how you want to visualize them and then they're, they're, they're nicer. And um, you can do them with, with base R as well, which we will also do, but these are just nicer plotting packages. So if you use read R and then we'll read in um, this sarcoma data file from the data folder. So when that's loaded, you should see that appear in your environment in our studio. So I've got a sarcoma file here. So if I drop down using this arrow here, it will show me the columns that I've got. So I've got an age. So this is actually a five year age brackets, uh, which you'll see actually, if you look just under the load script here, I've got a description of the data types of each column. And what we're going to do, uh, you can pick male or female because that's how they're, just, they're described and published at um, uh, or, and use either of them. But we're going to look at the difference between cases and rates. And we're going to first of all look at the relationship and then we're going to look at how we might approximate them using smoother functions. So I'm going to move on down then into exercise one. So there's a set of instructions for each part of this here. Um, I'm going to first of all suggest we use the view option uh, so I can visually show you the data set as if it was in the spreadsheet because it's a small data set and it's easy enough to understand what's going on. So I've used that and it's opened up here so as you can see each row here is an age range so it's the upper number of that five-year age band 
And then we have a number of cases reported in the time period of this particular data set. Uh, and then we have a, a population rate as well in the following, following columns. Um, and they're listed for male and females. So firstly, uh, let's visualize the distribution then. So starting then from line 36 onwards, I'm going to open ggplot. I hope you're familiar with ggplot. Uh, if you're not, ggplot's one of the sort of default R packages that people tend to use for um, slightly more advanced uh, plotting functions than base R. You can do a heck of a lot in base R, it's just harder. Um, ggplot is constructed very nicely where you can add lots of layers onto things. So what these plots are doing here, are they're saying for the sarcoma data set, they're using an aesthetic, which is a way to map data to a dimension. So I'm saying that I'm mapping to my x-axis, the age column from sarcoma, and to my y-axis, the male cases. Uh, and then I'm plotting a column, a geometric, or so a shape for a column. And uh, then there's a couple of things to label it and put some themes on, which just make it look a bit nicer. So firstly, I'm running that. And I'll run the female one in just a second. So what we've got here, so we've got the age profile. So if you look on uh, the x-axis here, we've got the age, and then we've got the number of cases reported. So as you can see, there's this spike here in late teens, early 20s, and then it drops off, uh, and then it rises again. There's a peak here in kind of late, sort of mid to late 50s, it appears, and then again, increasing with age. And then it drops off again, but that's, um, at the end in particular, that's a function of uh, life expectancy. So there are fewer people in those age groups at the upper end because there are fewer people alive by that point. Uh, and then just underneath is the female cases. So again, really similar sort of shape and profile. But the, there is a difference in life expectancy between male and female population, um, which is another function that adds sort of important thing that adds into this. But broadly, whichever one you use here, you're going to see that we've got this slightly unusual shape where we've got a peak at the beginning and then we've got kind of another peak towards the end. So you might describe it as maybe M-shaped or something like that or bimodal for those of you who like those, those terms. Um, so my first question to you then is, does the number of cases appear to be related to age? So my take on that is yes, but it's not linear per se. It does increase with age, but it increases differently for different ranges at different times. So there is a relationship there, but it's not as simple as it, it gets bigger as you get older. So let's try the same thing with the population rate instead. So you can see this is a similar plot to above, but what I've got here is the male rate rather than the male count, male cases, sorry, and the female rates of the female cases. And I've just colored them slightly differently. So the rate. So here, the rate, it's a bit more stark when you look at the rate. So again, we see that big bump in the um, late teens, early 20s. Um, and then actually it drops off because this is a function of where the, the population is. So there's more population in this area. Um, and then the rate per population goes up quite a lot by the end. And then similar story for females. Again, a function of the increasing life expectancy. You see it again, slightly higher on the end. So same question, yes, is my take on it. It does appear to be related to age, but again, it's not that linear as just being able to throw a line through it. But let's try, let's, let's see what throwing a line through it would do. So moving on down to section 83. So hopefully you're able to run these as we go. Um, what I'm gonna do now is build a linear regression model. And we've not got a lot of things to put into it here. But if we relate back to my slides from before, we're going to build this model. So we're going to say y is predicted by x. So we're going to end up with an intercept term um, and coefficient. So to do that in R, we use the LM function, the linear model function, and we write a formula. So first we put our y, and then this tilde function can be interpreted um, as, or I like to think of it as, is predicted by. So we're saying male rates is predicted by or is explained by age. Uh, and then you need to tell it what data set it's coming from. So we've got a data argument. So I've got a comma and then a data argument. So I'm going to run that LM. 
And the reason I've assigned this to um, a name, so I've created a linear model object rather than just running the linear model function, is because I can run stuff on that afterwards. So I can now run the summary function onto that model afterwards. The summary function on, a, on any sort of regression model is quite a nice function because it pulls out a whole bunch of relevant information. So I've just run the summary function there and I'll bring that up a little bit so we can see here. So stepping through the output, I've got a call. So that's what did you do? What, what function did you call? What did you run? Uh, then we've got the residuals. This is a description of the distribution of that error, but that's not important for now. But this is the thing that we talked about a minute ago. So these are the, the coefficients. So this is our intercept term. So it starts at 0 0.058. And then for each unit of age, it appears to increase. Um, so that is the, the male rate appears to increase by 0 0.01. So that's all well and good seeing the description, but what does that look like? So if we fit that model through ggplot, so I can actually do this through the GM smooth um, function here using the method linear LM. Um, so what this will do is it will go back and it will draw the chart from before, but it will print the linear model on top of it. So that's the model we've just fitted there. So just eyeballing that, would you say that's a good fit? I mean, it is, it is a fit. So it, you know, it, it is what the linear model says it is, but I would say uh, underscored, overscored, underscored, Easy. Oh, sorry, I'm saying it the wrong way around, actually. Overscored, underscored, because that's the line it's predicting. Um, so it's not the best fit, right? So let's go through and see if we can do a little bit better. So I talked about categorical stuff, but what we're not, we're not going to delve into that particular today. But I then moved on to polynomials before. So that was a combination of x plus x squared plus x cubed, etc. Now you can manually uh, put that into a linear model and I haven't done that here, but you could do, uh, I'm just gonna copy this out for ease. You could do something like this. So you could do, um, age plus age squared plus age cubed, et cetera. That, that's totally valid. Um, but there's a nice little function for doing it tidily um, and without delving into it too much. If you use this uh, poly function for polynomial, it uh, applies an orthogonality constraint on it. So it makes sure it sorts one of the possible problems out for you, basically. Um, so I'm saying to degree four. So what that means is that um, this model, so to the fourth power, age plus age squared, age cubed, age to the four. So that's what I'm going to fit instead. So if I run that, and then you can use either the summary or the ANOVA function, they give you a similar sort of outputs. So what summary does is summary gives you a coefficient for each polynomial, but ANOVA tests the whole term together, the pooled polynomial term together. So you're saying overall, the whole polynomial term is very significant because um, that's our p-value, because then if uh, I won't go to p-value testing today either, but um, we're generally considering a 95% threshold. So if you have a p-value of 0 0.05 or below, we'll consider that significant for the purposes of today. Well, and in general, I suppose. Um, but if you see here, this is each one of the polynomials. So this is sort of the um, dx plus one to the four, et cetera, and it builds it all up. Can I ask a question? Oh yeah, go for it. Um, what prompted you to go up to the fourth power then? Did you do three and then go, there's still nothing and then four? Um, sort of like select four? Yes, like so trial and error, really. Um, so you could um, you could say, if you know, if you know so you can just draw if, draw these functions out. So you, you can just draw like it and, and stick a value into it. So you, you can draw a plot of what X and X squared, et cetera, look like theoretically. And you can use those shapes to say if a combination of these shapes should be able to fit this, you know, if you're if you're that way minded. Um, but what I tend to do is sort of trial and error. I kind of start from three, 
and go from there. If three isn't well, I try four, and if four is the worst bit, then I back off to three um, and go that way around. So it is a bit trial and error. Um, there may be better ways of doing it, but that's the way I, I do it. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to now just plot this. And what I've done is I'm still fitting a linear model, but I'm putting that polynomial in. So I'm telling, make sure you fit the polynomial. So this time, this is what we've got going on. So this is actually the fit that we're, we're making here rather than the straight line fit. So actually the polynomial there has done a pretty decent job uh, of allowing that fit. Uh, and that's allowed us through the combination of those different um, uh, the, the, those different functions to flex the fit and then pull it together. So it gives you this much more flexible um, fit across the range. What I'm going to do now is just nip back and show you the next part, and we'll do this and exercise two. Sorry, exercise one B, and then we'll have a we'll have a break. So I'm going to move back to my slides now. So just before we go, so what we've got there is the mail rate, but we flex the fit by including the polynomial, which I hope you'll agree is a great improvement on what we had previously. Um, sorry, just uh, one question. Yeah, um, of course. When you've added those terms manually with yep. the, the power, uh, when I look at the summary of that, um, yes. it only shows age. It doesn't show the polynomials. Um, uh, okay, so let me just um, run that. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, I don't know why it does that, <laughs> and I'll confess to that. Um, so I would have to, I'd have to look into why that is. Um, so sorry, that's a, a bad answer for now. Okay, but we 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 would expect it to be the same. Um, I would expect it to have been the same. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it's pulling the whole term in. So let's have a look at uh, the ANOVA as to whether or not, and oh, no, that wouldn't do it, would it? No. Um, Oh, so what I want to see by looking at the polynomials there is whether or not um, I have a different estimate. So sorry, but the, the cogs are wearing in my brain a second. Um, yes, so I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you on that point. I'd have to go work that out and see if I can follow up. Um, okay, see sure. if I could, could, Thank I'll you. see if I could drop an answer into the YouTube comment or thing. Sorry, sorry that, that's, that's not the best answer. Sorry, I've got a question as well. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I was playing around with the the kind of degrees. I changed yep. from zero to like ten, and it doesn't seem to change the the smooth plot, the GG plot. Right. Um, so I'm not um, sure. Yeah, how does how does that work? Uh, <laughs> so you could so it, it's it's broadly similar, but it it's it's kind of wiggly. So we'll see this as we go into the next bit, that the more degrees of freedom you allow for any sort of smooth term, the more, the more kind of so-called wiggly it gets. So what you could suggest here though, is that this is potentially overfitting because it's maybe fitting a little bit too closely. What you'd have to do is you'd have to devise a testing scheme for that. Um, but we've maybe given, we don't have that many data points allowed too much flexibility in it. So we're fit, almost fitting to every individual point. Um, but it's a good point of, of how do you how do you know where to stop, right? Because you could just keep boosting it until it gets, you know, a better and better fit. Oh um, right, that's very dumb. Um, I see it in the in the chat. Someone's someone's found that. Yeah, I haven't changed the formula in the geom smooth. I was just changing the. Uh, uh, so in the in the, the regression seeing, above, was, yeah. yeah. It yes, it was sorry, I, I wasn't very clear at pointing you to the formula on that, but yeah, well spotted. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. No, great. Thank you. That that shows people are people are certainly looking at it the the right places and on it. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go back to uh, where I was a second ago on the um, the slides. So, so the next thing we were asking that question, weren't we? So, what if we can do something a bit more flexible? So, we've tried out with our polynomials at the moment, um, and they seem to do a decent job of flexing things. Um, so what we're actually doing here is we're fitting multiple functions of x. But what we could do is we can use our coefficients to multiply those functions, to boost the functions up. And then over the range of these functions, 
you can use them to so support is the term in literature. So if you could imagine literally physically supporting like a column might support a roof. Uh, so they're supporting the fit in that sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to start chaining things together uh, and seeing uh, how we can use these polynomials in a more flexible fashion. Um, and just as a quick plug for Noam Ross's course, Noam Ross has, has got a great online um, interactive GAM course, which some of this material is borrowed from. And I've, you know, judiciously referenced him, but it's definitely worth going through his material. Uh, I've just seen uh, Seb's comment in the chat. I'm just going to quickly read that. Uh, yes, um, this my, my, sorry, sorry, just sorry. Trying, yeah, no, I was just trying to answer that question before. I don't know if it, it's it's something to do with putting I around the polynomial part ah, of the equation, okay. but but it does it comes up with uh, the same. Oh, what have I said? The same residuals, but different estimates. So it, I don't know. I had a quick look on yeah. Stack Overflow. Thank you. So it sounds like it's silently fitting uh, everything as a function of age, then rather than fitting them separately so it's probably it's a slightly more advanced model fitting options i'm guessing than I'm, I'm maybe used to where you're you're splitting them out for individual terms rather than pooling them whereas the poly no the poly function appears to do both uh, but it also applies a constraint on the orthogonality so uh, i'm going to recommend you use the poly function and um what i didn't say before actually in our studio is like really really use the help files that's what they're there for. And there's so much stuff on all of these functions in the help files. Um, so if you're looking for a polynomial function, for example, poly, so it will explain to you the arguments it takes, um, exactly what it's doing, and it'll explain the details of the different bits and pieces. So uh, it really is, uh, really is useful. Um, so I'm just gonna nip back over to the slides then. Uh, thanks for looking it up, Seb, it's appreciated. Uh, Right, so we're going to use a thing called a spline. So the problem stems from, um, imagine you were uh, in the age before computer-aided designs, you were trying to draw, you're like a, a, on a big piece of paper or a big construction site, how would you draw a smooth curve that touches on a few different points? So the way that people used to do something like that, um, imagine if you're drawing plans for something, was to use a physical piece of wood that was referred to as a spline. It could be held in place under tension um, using something like nails or weights or other things. Um, so you could use these on big surfaces if you were creating things, or you could use them on plans and nail them if you were drawing things. Uh, and this is referred to as a spline. And there's some really nice properties about this. Um, one of which is the tension. So if you're bending a flexible strip of some kind, imagine there's maybe a, a thin piece of wood, then what it doesn't do is it doesn't kind of flap about and, and wiggle in lots of places where it's unnecessary because it flexes the, the sort of minimal amount to meet the points that it's constrained by. And that's actually quite a nice property for when we're trying to fit to data because what we would like to do is to, to induce some degree of tension if you like so we get a smooth fit because if we're trying to get the general relationship of everything rather than the overfitted relationship of everything you probably wanted to draw as smooth a function as possible so these have been applied to um, polynomials in a kind of mathematical context so what we end up doing, and the, forgive the description at the top here, but the, the description is we, we're creating a smooth from piecewise polynomials. So that means we can get polynomials and we can stick them together in pieces to go all the way along the fit. So you might have um, a, a limited polynomial of degree three. So a degree three polynomial can draw an S shape basically. And with that, you can stick lots of them together and sort of theoretically, you could draw almost any kind of two-dimensional fit by, by sticking lots of these together. And the question then becomes, how many do we need to stick together? And what points do we stick them together at? And those points you stick them together at would be, relating it back to the draftsman spline, would be where those nails or ducts or whatever held the spline in place. Um, so what we refer to them as is not points, because they, they're kind of tying the two polynomials together. So you can see this is the original sigmoidal fit from earlier in the slides. 
So we drew a smooth sigmoidal curve over it. But fitting the same thing using splines, you can see there's a little bit more flex in some of this here. But where it needs to be more smooth, it's pulled nice and smooth across the range of it. So you can actually get quite a nice precise fit with enough flexibility to flex where it needs to. So how do you control them though, which is the main thing. So if I say, put a spline in this fit, what, what have I got to play with to tune that spline? So you've got two things. So number one, you've got the knot points. So the, the how many polynomials do you have and where do you join them? So um, the more knots you introduce, the more wiggly your spline can be because there's more, more points for it to flex around. Uh, so you can see on my plot on the left here, I've got three different colors starting at 3, 20, and 50. And the 3, as you can see, is quite smooth because there's only a few points it can flex from, uh, whereas the higher uh, numbers of knot points actually get much wigglier because they can uh, flex around lots of different points. You've also got another thing here, or a penalty. So if you're used to other machine learning models or things where you've heard the term regularization, um, it's the same sort of idea, is that you apply a penalty to your fit to dampen the effect down, to smooth it down. So we balance in the fitting of a spline at the number of knot points and a penalty that we estimate from the data. So we have enough knot points for it to be flexible, and then we have a penalty that pulls it as tight as possible across the fit. So um, here you can see we've got the, uh, the penalties. So if I have a, a low penalty, it allows a sort of more wiggly fit, and the higher the penalty, the uh, smoother the fit is forced to be. So there's a combination then of knot points and penalty. So uh, the next kind of example will be then, then us fitting this to the data and seeing how we can use that. So let's move back over to our studio. And on the same script, following on from there, uh, from 135 onwards, what we're going to do is um, we're going to fit using splines. And there's a couple of different spline packages in base R. Um, I'm using splines two here, but just because splines two has a slightly nicer function that I prefer to use. Splines one, or just splines, works um, just the same. And there are a kind of sp specific spline packages for the things as well, if you have very specific examples. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna fit another linear model again to the mail rates, because that was the one I started on, um, using this function here, natural spline. And I'm applying it to age, and I'm applying four degrees of freedom. Um, so the reason I'm using the natural spline function is that there are, there are lots of uh, different spline functions of B splines or, or kind of a standard as well. Um, but the natural spline has a few nice properties, which because I haven't used it for a little while and not on the tip of my tongue, but it's about, um, one of them is about um, what it does on the edges of its range, for example. So if, um, on the extremes of your data, if you were to generalize this spline, should it then project kind of outwards in an average fashion from the last data point? Um, are you happy with it being unconstrained? Because some of them just fly off wildly and things like that. So the natural spline, um, generally has a, a useful property for the sort of thing that we're, we're modeling. If you're interested in the details, do look it up in the help files or in any of the references that I've got um, on the last slide. But we're going to use this natural spline function. So I've run that model and then I'm running the summary. So again, we've got the call. And like you saw before, we've got um, the multiple different parts of that function coming through you here, each with a coefficient. And if I was to pull that using the ANOVA, we should see the combined spline functions significance. So there we go underneath there. So we, are, we already know that there's a decent fit because there's a decent relationship there. And we we're only describing it with one thing. But what I've done here is I've done a couple of different things. So that is saying, um, just allow it four degrees of freedom and it will pick sort of the average knot points. It'll divide the range up and it will just into four portions. Um, what you can do is you could choose specific age ranges. So bearing in mind the age ranges in my data, I've sort of arbitrarily picked there 24, 
49 and 79 and said put my knots at those ranges. So that, that will allow four degrees of freedom there, I think, still. So this is where we get sort of get into the dance of the degrees of freedom of a spline. So if you fix your knot points, what you've actually got is you've got a, a, a spline before your first knot and then between one and two, between two and three, between three and four, and then four to the end of your data, plus the, cons the identifiability constraint and the minus one. So this is that gets very complicated, so we'll park that for the moment. But um, I've fixed three data points as knots. So if I look at the uh, the R square there, what I didn't do is I didn't follow my own notes there. So I just check my um, adjusted R squared there on the previous one, uh, and actually both of these approaches yield very similar results because there's enough flexibility from those data points anyway. But if I was to go back up to my summary with a polynomial, um, actually it's performed less well there than my polynomial degree four. Um, so my adjusted R square there was much higher. Um, that happens, you know, that's life. It does, it, it, sometimes you get a better fit with a different function. Um, but the purpose of today is learning how to use these spline functions in GAMS. So let's go and plot that then. So plotting the spline function using the four degrees of freedom. So it's just divided up the range for me. So it's just stuck these polynomials together for me across the range. And then I've specifically anchored them at 24, 49 and 79. So if I was to then flick between my two plots, they're almost identical. So it, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to the fit particularly when you generalize up into a massive data set, it wouldn't, wouldn't make a huge amount of difference. Um, but my point of illustrating that is there is you've got two ways to fit those splines. You can either say, I want a certain number of degrees of freedom and you choose the knot points for me. Or you can say, I want these knot points and it will then estimate between those. So either approach is, is perfectly valid. So that's the end of uh, the first section. So I've been talking at you for, for nearly an hour. Um, what we'll do is we'll take 10 minutes or so uh, and have a break. But just before we do that, uh, so we'll come back at what, uh, 2211. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything they wanted to point out or discuss at this point? Um, I was wondering when you have, for example, like you have here, that, that trailing one being really low, if you thought, for example, that that was through to chance and wasn't necessarily an accurate reflection of what was going on. Would you try and adjust these things to, to not have that leveling off if you thought that was an overfit or would you, if you had like a scientific uh, so reason like, not like believing we had, Like we had the 10 before and, and it was overfitting. Well, like um, here, for example, you've got the two humps and then it goes down with age and you don't see yeah. that if you look at the women, for example, and maybe yeah. for whatever scientific reason in a different data set, you yeah. don't believe that as an artifact of like, really low numbers or something yeah um i guess yeah do you have the flexibility to kind of bring that up or or would you always try and be more more data-led would you ever kind of try and use the knowledge of the system to override your model in that kind of a way i think um again the risk of giving you a bad answer like i think you've you've just described the the thoughtful pragmatic approach of someone modeling data well so there are a bunch of different ways to look at it depending on your system um, and whatever you choose in the end if you have a rationale for choosing that that is often probably the the way you would do it you would end up choosing the model that you think is most rational and then explaining why you think that's the most rational um, you can be very very data led but that makes the assumption that your data are fairly accurate in your sample uh, to the relationship you're trying to generalize and you know it's a there's pros and cons of most things. Um, so what you can do as you go into the GAMS is you can apply higher penalties. So you can um, sort of manually, so we, the, the GAMS will estimate the penalties for you, um, but you can apply higher order penalties to pull the fit flatter than was estimated by the GAM sort of in its natural state, um, which I had to do um, on my PhD work with um, Poisson regressions on really over dispersed data. So, um, 
really what it ended up doing was overfitting it and I had to be a, a bit meaner about it and apply quite a high penalty and say actually really I'm trying to generalize to a much smoother relationship than my data wants to fit here because I think my data is an artifact. So um, yeah I suppose it's, it's rational choices of the, the modeler at the end of the day but this is where trying to visualize stuff as much as possible as you go helps inform your choice. Thank you. That's really helpful and uh, yeah, scary probably. in the context of yes. multi-dimensional data where you can't visualize it. <laughs> yes, um, and that is one of the big problems with them when you start getting into lots and lots of predictors and you get into lots of smooth terms, for example, that becomes really tricky. You have to start relying on the approximate um, uh, significance of smooth terms and things like that and trying different formulations and seeing which works better. Um, we'll get we'll get into that shortly. But I'll, uh, I'll stop us there for, uh, for a 10 minute break uh, and I'll see you back in 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so what we're gonna do now is move on from the first session. So first session that we went through, uh, we looked at um, just kind of backing up a revision of um, linear models um, and how we might uh, fit data that doesn't form a strict linear pattern between uh, predictor and response. Uh, we looked at um, how linear fit and categorical and polynomial fits work. And we looked um, at the end of the session at splines, which are uh, piecewise polynomials, so that we have several polynomials that are connected through knot points, and how that allows us a lot of flexibility to describe uh, a complex pattern. What we're now going to do is move on to the generalized additive model. Um, and you'll see where smoothers fit into this. Uh, so I'm just going to add a bit more kind of background and theory. Again, a lot of this is indebted to uh, Simon Wood's fantastic book. And Simon Wood, the author of MGCV package, really is the authority on these. Um, I should say there are two schools of thought on generalized additive models. Um, Hasty and Tipsharani um, in, in, and Friedman in their great book, Elements of Statistical Learning, talk about it. Um, forgive me, I can't remember whether it's Hasty or Tipsharani's um, kind of, I think, thesis work um, developed the framework for these originally where they had a different type of smoothers, where they had a knot point um, at every data point and it was fitted differently through penalties. Um, Simon Wood's take on it is a so-called reduced rank version where we use fewer knot points and we try and enforce a more general relationship. Uh, I, I'm steering towards Simon Wood's take on it with this, this session. That might mean nothing to any of you, but if you start reading any of the references, um, it's the direction that Simon Wood has taken it that I'm, that I'm teaching here, and that's what MGCV does. Okay, so we looked before at regression models. Now, you can consider a generalized additive model to be a regression model with smoothers. So broadly, what we're trying to fit here is that rather than what we had before, which is why um, it's predicted by an intercept plus beta times function of x. Um, what we've got here is we're essentially, as our beta x, we're, we're wrapping x in a function as we do it. So that might kind of expand in a kind of more formal fashion, if you like, and this is taken from Simon Wood, where particularly if you use them as a generalized here, so I'll just um, take a side um, point to the generalized section. So the linear model that we looked at before can be considered a subclass of the generalized linear model. Um, so for those of you who've done anything like Poisson regression, logistic regression, et cetera, they are all uh, applications of the generalized linear model. Um, you could regard the linear model as a special case of that where it has um, the Gaussian distribution, the normal distribution as its distribution, uh, and it has a link function of identity. So equals um but kind of with other responses you can be you can fit different functions different link functions so what that then transforms to is we have a, an expectation of y um so really we have a, a function of the expectation of y so that's it we have some functional form of our output is predicted by so this can be our regular model parameters. So this is a matrix of as many regular regression coefficients as you want. But 
you can then have as many different functions as you like. So we might have a, a polynomial function around x1. We might have a spline function around uh, x2, etc. We might even have a smooth function of more than one predictor. So we might have x3 and x4. So it's a really very flexible general class where you can wrap things in smooth functions. You can wrap more than one term in a smooth function. Um, but you also don't have to. You can put just regular straight parametric terms into it as well. So they're a very, very general class of models, but they're almost like a higher order again out from the generalized linear model. Uh, now, functioning on the sec focusing on the second word, uh, they are strictly additive, which uh, we'll come back to in the um, advanced bit at the end, uh, depending on where we are on time. Um, so that has uh, consequences if you want to use interaction terms. Uh, but generally what we're doing is we're building a bunch of smooth functions of variables and adding them together to form the expectation of your output. So it's you can consider it for your general understanding to be like a GLM, but with smooth functions around the predictors. So it's a, a generalized linear model with smooth functions. So what that means is that we, uh, we end up applying them over into... Um, our regression context, things where we have difficult wiggly fits that could be better described as a smooth function rather than the underlying data, um, then we can apply that into our regression model and it boosts the power of our regression model generally. Um, as I said before, Hasty and Tibshirani, sorry, Hasty has a slightly different take on it in, in the original formulation of a GAM. Um, and Simon Wood has this um, reduced rank version of it to save degrees of freedom and for another perspective. But the difference is that Simon Wood's take, I guess, uses the minimal number of not points and smoother functions, whereas Hasty goes about it a slightly different way. But the issues of doing this, so I talked before when we had the, uh, the diagram of the splines, um, I'll just snip back to that. We had both the not points, so the number of, of not, so the number of functions we have, but we also had a, a penalty, which then sort of penalizes it and pulls the, the um, fit tight, if you like. So that leads us to the natural question of how many knot points do I need and what penalty do I need to apply and how do I know that? So there's a couple of kind of quirks about this, um, which it's worth you knowing. Um, I'm sorry to do this to you, but if you, you, it's worth reading this a few times to get your head around it. But functionally, what I'm saying is that if you take an unpenalized um, smooth function that has um, a certain number of knot points, you know how many degrees of freedom that has. But once you apply a penalty to it, what you've done is you've reduced the effect of that. So actually, you only have a partial degree of freedom now for each one of your former degrees of freedom. And you have a thing that's referred to as the effective degrees of freedom. And you might have seen this in other places like neural networks or other things like that. Um, and um, Hasty Tibshirani and Friedman write about it at length in, in elements of statistical learning and stuff. But you end up with the so-called effective degrees of freedom, which is your original degrees of freedom after they've been penalized. Um, now, the upshoot of that is that if you like infinitely penalize something, essentially you put an infinitely large penalty on it, you would reduce the smooth down to zero. So it has the potential to smooth completely flat. And that's a kind of natural consequence. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to estimate the correct amount of penalty to pull it as tight as possible whilst also fitting our data. Okay, and what we're going to use here is the MGCV package, which stands for uh, Mixed GAM Computation Vehicle, logically, because we'd all we'd all know that. Um, but written by Professor Simon Wood, it's now got into the core uh, of of, of our, the you know, the R core distribution. So um, you you won't need to install this package if you have R; you already have it. Um, it links in very nicely with ggplot because if you ever use Geom Smooth in ggplot, beyond a certain number of points, it uses a GAM to estimate the smooth for you anyway, because it's just the most efficient way for it to do it. Um, in general, this package has got really sensible defaults. So if you say, fit smoother to this, go, it will make a really sensible guess. 
Uh, and I know for those of us who are smart enough to go into the ins and outs of this, that's alarming because you want to know what it's guessed. But it, but they are generally quite reasonable. So it's not a bad place to start with using all the defaults uh, and then tweaking from the defaults. Um, there are also, because it's a very deep waters, this package, there are lots of different ways to do all the estimation of the smooths. Um, but uh, restricted maximum likelihood is sort of recommended as the kind of the best way in, in Simon Wood's books. Um, so I'm going to suggest that to you. Um, it doesn't mean the others are invalid. It's just that over the years of doing it, they've settled upon that being their preferred method. So how does it work? So it works similar to a regression model that we've seen before. So if you use the library MGCV, and again, this is just creating an object called MyGAM. So rather than GLM or LM for your function here, we're opening GAM, GAM. And we're saying y is predicted by, and then we wrap a smooth function around x. So s is a shorthand for this uh, smooth function. Uh, and you could supply a lot of different arguments to the smoothers to control them. So here I've supplied a, um, what type of basis function it is, because um, we've looked at splines, but gams can be fitted with a huge range of different types of smoothers. Splines are the kind of easiest and most intuitive and most useful in first applications, um, but they they will fit all sorts of things. Um, we're we're going to stay for the most part with um, splines today. Um, there is a sort of a multi-dimensional kind of extension which are referred to uh, as thin plate splines. So they're very similar, but um, where we've imagined bending a flexible strip for a spline, imagine it's more like a flexible plate. So you've got a kind of a sheet of a material and you bend it to fit a certain um, sheet. So it's kind of, it's a three dimensional rather than two, but it, they can be N dimensional, which blows your mind a little bit if you try and visualize it. Um, so as I said, the defaults are determined. Um, so they, what they do for each smoother is they put a default maximum uh, of kind of 10 degrees of freedom in, um, and then they estimate the penalty for you. Now you can change the number of uh, degrees of freedom and you can change the penalty to your heart's content. Um, but what we'll do is we'll rely on that to start with and we'll see the differences when we tweak it. So then just like a GLM, you might run the summary function and you'll get the bits and pieces out, which is the, you know, what did you run? The description um, of the parametric coefficients. So if you put any, put any coefficients in that aren't wrapped in a smoother, they will be uh, estimated at the top, just like a normal regression with the, uh, the coefficient uh, or estimate and then the significance value. And then underneath you'll have this thing here that says approximate significance of smooth terms, which is the first big difference here. So because I put a smooth of X in, I can't directly interpret the coefficients for the smooth of X. Because if, if my spline has several different polynomials in them and they've had a penalty applied to them, what good is knowing that this one needs to be multiplied by 1.5 and that one needs to be multiplied by 2.1? It, it, it doesn't make sense to you. So what you're most interested in is, is the total of the smooth um, statistically significant on your data? So is that, is that smoother actually having a, a reasonable effect on your data? So that's why they're reported in such a way as an approximate significance of the smooth. And the reason it says approximate is because of that thing I mentioned before about the effective degrees of freedom, which is the number of degrees of freedom after the penalty has been applied. So we're starting to get into rather hairy territory here. So um, what we're looking for is to have approximately, uh, sorry, we're looking to have a significant smoother to warrant it being in. But you might ask, how do I check my smoothers? So we'll look at that again in a second. But the other things that are useful for you on the end of it here are your adjusted R squared and your percentage of deviance explained as well. That's also quite useful because it's a similar idea. And it was mentioned in the chat before um, uh, about checking uh, linear model assumptions. Um, yes, totally, totally valid thing to do. You want to check that you've got reasonable distribution of your residuals and things like that as well. So just like you would with a linear model or a generalized linear model, you can plot 
um, the charts, you can either use it by plot, but if you use a function gamcheck, gamcheck does two things for you. Number one, it plots these charts, which is what you would get from the plot. But secondly, it also gives you this output, which is um, about uh, the how uh, how the smoothers have been fitted. So the bit at the top here is telling you what optimizer it used and what method. So that rather than using Remel here, it's used GCV, which is generalized cross validation. Um, and this means stuff to people who are smarter than me, but uh, it doesn't mean a huge amount to me at this point. But the bit that's important here is about uh, describing the dimensions for your smooth. So um, your effective degrees of freedom uh, versus your degrees of freedom. So K, if you remember K at the beginning is our basis dimension. So that was our degrees of freedom that we started with. After penalty, the effective degrees of freedom were 6.09. Uh, and then there's a P value on the end here. And the thing you need to remember about it, this particular test is calibrated to know whether to say whether or not you've got enough degrees of freedom in your smooth to accurately describe the data. So if this here is statistically significant, so is the is very low, so we use this to 0 0.05. Um, <laughs> I've just seen Sam's comment, yes. It's, it's always nice when uh, you, you look at something, you go, how does it work, and it goes magic, um, which is, is never the best answer. Um, but yeah, so if this p-value is, is significant, so it is very low, so you might want to use your 0 0.05 criteria, that means you haven't got enough um, degrees of freedom in your smooth to accurately um, describe the data. So here we're fine because it's 0 0.93, so there's enough flexibility in that smooth to describe the data. But if this is very, very low, I might want to increase the number of degrees of freedom in my smooth um, to allow it to accurately describe it. So then uh, let's check this back against the linear model that we calculated earlier on this data set. So that was the, the linear model, the y is predicted by x. So I'm then doing an ANOVA test comparing the linear model against the GAM. Uh, and the, the output of that, as you might expect, is that it's very significantly better. The other thing that you could do, um, for those of you who are aware of AIC, um, AIC or indeed BIC are slightly more agnostic ways of um, checking uh, how well your model fits your data. They're information criterion based and broadly lower is better. Um, there is some theory on AIC um, around uh, by relating it, I think, to um, the chi-square distribution. I think um, it escapes me at the moment, but if you have an AIC difference of four, that asymptotically corresponds to a 95% confidence kind of test of being better. So if one of your models is has a lower AIC of four or more, that's the better model. If they're around, if they're around the same, that, that what it's telling you is, is they're functionally very similar. So if I had two five six two and two five six zero, there's nothing between them. But here there is a lot between them. The GAM is very noticeably lower, so the GAM is the better model. So it's losing less information in, term, in AIC terms. OK, so let's go and apply them to the data that we've been working on and see how we can, we can fit that GAM. So going back over into RStudio, uh, and this time we're going to open the next exercise, exercise number two the osteosarcoma GAM. So the first bit of the script is just what we did on the, the original one. It was just in case you were coming back to it fresh to reload the data. You don't need to reload that if you've still got it in memory. You can skip straight down to 24. So now, just as we saw on the slide, we're going to fit a GAM using the MGCV package. And we're going to allow it to use its defaults, its sensible defaults to choose for us. Um, and then we can start looking at it. So load your MGCV package. And then here, I, I'm again, I'm sticking with the male rates one because that's the example I've used on the previous bits, but you can use female rates if you want. That, that's perfectly fine. Um, so difference here from the GLM is that we've got GAM rather than GLM, and we've got age wrapped in the S function, the smoother function.
So I should say, much like uh, GLM here, because I haven't specified a family argument, it's assuming that it's normally distributed. It's assuming Gaussian as a default. Uh, and that's fine because it was, a, it was a linear one we were checking. So if I run my summary on that model, so we'll get the thing that we saw previously. So we've got our parametric coefficients. So you'll notice that the, in, the intercept is a parametric coefficient because we haven't applied any smoothers on the intercept because that's kind of nonsensical. So the intercept comes up in that bit. But then our approximate significance of our smooth terms. So it looks like the smooth on age is uh, highly um, significant. And our, um, our adjusted R squared is to 0.72 which you'll note is probably higher than when we used the spline fit previously and is about similar to where we were with the polynomial fit. But this is in a more principled way. So what this has done is it's worked out in the process of fitting using uh, up to 10 degrees of freedom what penalty you need to apply and it's estimated the smoother for you uh, as well as fitting the model. So that's the nice thing about, uh, about GAMS through MGCV is that it estimates the smooth parameters whilst it fits the model. Uh, yes, I can, I can go through the, um, the some of the diagnostic stuff as we go. Um, so um, first thing I might want to do here then is to plot some of the results. So plotting the model above here, um, I'm telling it, if you default plot, this is base R, so I'm saying plot sarcoma GAM1. I'm saying, yes, plot the residuals, and this is just um, base R shorthand for what type of point do you want? One is an open circle, two is a triangle, etc. So it's not a special function of plotting a gam. It's just a, a shorthand for R's plotting functions for use, use circles. So what we've got here is um, the smooth that has been determined and estimated from the data. So it's not very wiggly. Uh, it's wiggly enough because the penalty has pulled it flat. And when we looked over here, you'll see that there is the effective degrees of freedom of 6.343. So it has applied some penalty. And these circles here, these are the residuals. So because we don't have very many data points, I can see all of the individual residuals. It's not looking like a cloud of residuals. But actually, that's not bad there, is it? We've got one or two that are out of the range of the, the confidence interval there. So that's a two standard deviation confidence interval that comes out with it. So actually, that's not a bad fit. So earlier on, I mentioned a couple of other packages that were quite useful, um, that do things in more of a ggplot kind of friendly way, um, or they just have extra functions, being uh, Gratia and MGCVs. Um, the reason I, uh, I'm not loading Gratia into memory and I am loading MGCVs, I'm just calling bits out of Gratia, is because they have some similarly named functions. And if I load both of them, they start to compete. So I'm just pulling this directly out of Gratia. So this is using the Gratia draw function. So you'll see it's the same plot. It's just ggplot style. Um, but the nice thing about that is you could create a ggplot object and you could format it up however you like if you're you know you're into using ggplot from there. So you could use all of the, uh, the the themes and the styles and everything else you might want to use on ggplot. Similarly with mgcviz, you first it's a slightly more complicated process. So you first have to create like a visualization object and then you tell it what bits. Um, to call out of it. So this looks horrendously complicated, but I'll just step you through it. And all of it is explained well on the website and in the health functions. But first of all, you call out the visualization elements of your model into an object, so I called it B. And then I'm creating a plot called O here. And then with O, I'm then adding lots of different lines into it. So you'll see now when I put this, I've put like a, uh, rug distribution of the the age ranges on that axis and other things. Again, I've borrowed this from the um, the MGCVIS site. I, I'll confess personally, I don't use MGCVIS. I use Gratia or default plots. But there's a lot of functionality there, and I just wanted to show it to you. So if you do get into using 
these sorts of plots, you've got a lot of power um, with MGC Viz. But I personally felt it was a step too complicated for my needs. So what else might you want to see? So just like in any other regression model, you can pull out elements of it. So you can pull out the residuals or coefficients or stuff. So um, how many coefficients do you think we would have then for a model where we've applied this spline? So let's have a look. So we've got our intercept term here. So we, and we've got actually ended up with nine functions. Uh, and that was because we allowed up to the 10 degrees of freedom plus the minus one constraint, as I described earlier in the degrees of freedom bit. So it's ended up with nine, but it's applied a penalty. Because when we looked at our diagnostic information before on the, uh, what was it? It was on the GAM check, wasn't it? Oh no, I haven't run GAM check yet, have I? Apologies. Um, let's, let's run GAM check. That's me tripping over my own material there, sorry. Let's run GAM check as well. So I'll step through the plots in a second. Um, so what GAM check has done here, again, it's told us it did it by magic. Um, but we've got up to nine dimensions there, sorry, to nine parameters for in the smooth, uh, which come from the 10 degrees of freedom. And then we've got the effective degrees of freedom after the penalty, which has been brought down to 6.34. So there has been a penalty applied to it. So it drew a smooth, the smooth was a bit wiggly, it applied a penalty to pull it straighter and tighter. Uh, and that's how you get the smoothest fit. And that's broadly how MGCV works. You allow a bit more, uh, not point, uh, uh, a few more knot points or a few more degrees of freedom than is kind of strictly necessary and you allow the penalty to pull it smooth. So we've got um, four plots here that just appeared. So much like you um, uh, would do your diagnostics of a linear model, um, you get four plots come out of it if you plot uh, any of the regression models. So you get the deviance residual. So this is the, the residuals is the remaining error. And you have a theoretical quantile, so this is the, uh, the distribution across the kind of theoretical range. So ideally, you want all of your points to line up across this line. Um, they never line up perfectly, and for some reason, I've got the tiniest points here on this plot. Um, now, you expect, it, it, pragmatically, when you're doing it in real life, you tend to find that, that it comes off the rails a little bit at the extremes from the kind of outlier data points. But we do have a little bit of a wiggle here. So it might be that actually it's not doing very well in the slightly upper range here. Um, so maybe there's more going on in this model than age would explain on its own, which would make a whole load of sense, but we don't have many data points. So you can't really do a whole lot more than age because we only have age to go on. Uh, so next plot, similarly we've got a uh, Residuals versus the linear predictors. So these are, are um, the predicted values versus the, linear, the the residuals. And ideally, you you kind of want to see no discernible pattern. So we've got a histogram of the residuals here. So we've got the midpoint, the zero here. Um, ideally, you'd like to see that normally distributed, but it doesn't look that way. It looks like we've got uh, more of a lump here in the low end. So it looks like we're having more of a problem on the lower end, estimating it than we are on the upper end. Ideally, you want to see that peak around zero. So again, not a perfect model. And again, response versus fitted values. Um, ideally, you'd like to see these as close as possible because it means your model is predicting them well. So the, what was the actual response versus the model's predicted response? So ideally, you'd like to see these line up for the data points. So where one was 0.5, you'd expect the other to be 0.5. So they're usually your diagnostic details. Um, forgive me, I haven't I haven't got my criteria for the linear model to hand, so I can't remember exactly them, but I've, I seem to remember there's four criteria that, that needs to be satisfied. Um, Maybe those amongst you who have it to hand might be able to drop it in. Um, but the same principle applies to a GAM. So what you've done is you've you've messed around with your predictors, but it doesn't change the shell of the model. If it's still um, 
a linear model through a GAM, you still expect the same uh, diagnostics of a linear model that you would, plus the element of the, is my smooth big enough? So that's what GAM check was, saying, have I got enough degrees of freedom? And yes, I've got enough degrees of freedom here because my p-value wasn't significant. So sorry, that, that's quite a lot there. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll uh, carry on going through this and then I'll just back up slightly. So my point to you here when I was saying looking at the coefficients is really, it's not a lot of use trying to interpret these coefficients for different portions of a spline. And this is why we don't use GAMs in this way as explanatory models. So we're not trying to quantify the effect of each individual predictor. We're trying to fit the best form of each predictor that allows us to make the best prediction with the model. So we're using it as a predictive model, not as an explanatory model. And that's where you see with um, many, I suppose many of the machine learning things are the likes of your XG boosts and other things. Um, the, the thing that you're fitting is actually, the, it might have some very mad transformation, or neural networks particularly, you might have some very mad transformations of things, but if they give you um, a, a better prediction output, you're less bothered about that because your model's not about explaining it, it's about predicting it. Uh, oh, thanks, Paul. This dropped into chat about the assumptions there of the linear model. Okay, so what else can we do? So uh, I like to do the sort of predict um, function onto the data and they're kind of plotting that back kind of manually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create back onto my sarcoma data set that we've been using. Uh, I'm going to create a column called GAM1 preds, so predictions from my GAM. So I'm using the predict function here and saying predict about, and now generally you want to specify the new data that you're predicting onto. And I know it's the same data set, but I'm saying fit my model to this data. So you should see now in the sarcoma data set here, we've got a new column called GAM1 preds. So if this model was perfect, this should perfectly match the value for uh, male cases because that was what I was predicting. Or female cases if you use female cases. Um, just by way of comparison, I'm gonna actually also do the same for the linear model that we did before. So on the previous exercise, so I'm picking up the sarcoma LM that we created earlier, and I'm using that in the predict function as well. And I'm creating a new column called LM preds. And the same for the polynomial fit that we did in the first exercise. So that's picking up the LM poly object that we created before. So I created three columns of the different predictions from each of the different types of models that we fitted. And I'm going to compare each of them now against the, the actual value. So using ggplot underneath here, I'm plotting male rates. And for each of these different colors, I'm plotting the gam in purple, the linear model in uh, medium aquamarine, which is a nice description, um, and the polynomial in orange or orange two. And there is an AB line. So that is the, um, the reference, if you like. So that is where the predictions should fit the, um, uh, so, so the, 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 gosh, I'm tripping over my words, the response and the predicted values. So let me just zoom this in a little bit. So I think you might agree, if you squint at this hard enough, that the orange ones are probably the furthest, oh no, sorry, the, the, the medium aquamarine, or turquoisey ones are the furthest really from the, the line. And that is the, the estimation of the linear model. Then the orange is not doing too bad a job and the purple is not doing too bad a job. And they're, they're kind of fairly similar looking. So how else could we test this? So when we do our model diagnostics, we're often interested in the sum of the squared residuals. Um, now that should be the total error. So residuals are the remaining error after your prediction. So some of them are positive and some of them are negative um, because some of them are below your prediction and some of them are above your prediction. Now, if you don't square them, what they end up doing is they average each other out and you hit zero point. 
So in order to get an estimation of the total error, what we do is we square them, they all become positive, and then we compare them on the squared. So I'm now looking at the sum of the squared residuals for each one. So for each model, uh, I am running the residual function, squaring it, and then summing it up. So linear model, my sum of my squared residuals, 2.48. Polynomial model, that's a big improvement. So much, much smaller error, 0 0.085. And with the GAM, 0.725. So the GAM has been a further improvement because the little bit of extra flexibility with the penalty in the GAM allows it to tighten up around the polynomial. So the polynomial was a good job, um, but the GAM's allowed it to be a little bit extra precise where it's pulled it around. So just to whip back through what we've done there, so what we've done is we've fitted um, a fairly simple GAM using MGCV where we've wrapped a smooth function around H. Then I had a little look at the outputs in the summary and the plots um, and also through GAM check. So we used GAM check to check that our smoother had enough degrees of freedom to actually capture our data. Uh, because if it doesn't, then you need to allow more. Uh, we had a quick look at some of the diagnostic plots. And then what we've done is we've compared the predicted values from our model, our GAM model against the linear model and against the polynomial model from the first one, plotted them out onto here, where I think we could see some of the, visually some of the difference, but then we looked at it in terms of the sum of the squared residuals. So the remaining error in the model, we made that into an absolute by squaring it um, and then we summed them up. So the, the one with the lowest error overall in terms of our predictions against our original model is 0.725 uh, is the GAM. Uh, and you could say, I've got yes, I've got no training and test set and all of that. Yes, of course, that is a problem. Um, but I've only got about 10 data points or something like, what is it, 19 data points here. So it was a bit tricky to do any more than that. Yes, in a real world, you might really want to have a holdout sample and do that sort of, you know, and, and do it properly. Yes. Um, but here to keep it simple, because I wanted a nice, easily visible data set, we've, we're, we're working on just a few points. Okay, so that was the basics of fitting a GAM. So fit, fitting a simple GAM, having a look at our smooth and seeing if our smooth was, it was a decent fit uh, and then comparing it against the other options. Let me just check my slides. So um, that's what I used to do a break after that one, but we, we do, we've moved it around a bit today. Um, so I'm going to throw us straight into the next exercise and then we'll break there after that one, uh, which is to look at the GAM fitting options. So what we've just looked at, no tweaking involved. You know, we've just trusted the sensible default options, uh, which turned out to do a really good job. Um, but let's have a look at how we can flex some of the options. So if you were to go to exercise number three, what we're going to do now is we're going to run through a bunch of different tweaks to the GAM and then look at visualizing them and see what the difference is. So again, at the top here, uh, it's just got the, the reloading the sarcoma data if you hadn't got it. Uh, and building the GAM that you need for this exercise if you hadn't already got it. But this exercise properly begins from 34 onwards. So I mentioned in passing before that um, there's a thing called a thin plate spline, which is a, a more general spline, which allows you to do it in lots of different dimensions. It's worth letting you know that MGCV uses thin plate splines as its default. If you don't tell it to use a different type of spline, it will use a thin plate. Um, for visualizations purposes, and just to keep it nice and simple, um, I have changed in our example on uh, line 43 here, to uh, to use the the CR uh, function, so this is um, a, a, a cubic regression spline. So it's the same as the natural splines that we've used earlier. So the idea is that just to keep it simple and similar to what we've seen earlier. So I've de I've deliberately set this basis here, but that's one of the first things that you can change. So I said about using the help here before. So this is the code way to find help as opposed to going to the help window here and typing S in. Uh, so if you actually look for the help on S, um, it gives you a, the whole range of the different things that you can set and tweak for the smoothers. So there's quite a lot of different options. 
And the thing that I'm altering first here is the basis, so is the type of um, type of smoother. So you can see there the default TP, that's thin plate. And there are a number of other options here. So the one I've picked here is CR for cubic regression spline, which is what a natural spline is. So I'll fit that one. So that's that's slightly different to the first fit because I've forced it into a cubic regression spline. It won't be that different because they're very, very similar. Again, so that's what we saw on the previous exercise uh, where we plotted just the basic spline. So we've got the residuals um, and the fitted spline. But let's start to mess around with it a little bit more. So the first thing I'd like us to change is to change the, the dimensions, so the number of degrees of freedom. So um, we can change quite a lot of options here. So let's boost it to a few different ones. So you can see, because I'm terrible at naming things, I've just named them sequentially, which tends to make me come a cropper later. But I'm changing here from 3 to 6 to 9 to 12. So if you run all of those, what I'm going to do now is now plot each one of them individually. And you'll see how um, the increasing number of uh, degrees of freedom allows the spline to become more wiggly over time. So the fewer you have, the straighter the smoother is enforced to be because it's only got three degrees of freedom there and two of them at the end. So it's got to fix the middle somewhere. So that's very, very straight. Six. That's actually very similar to what we had. And if you remember before, we had a effective degrees of freedom of about six point something. So that's actually really similar to the the um, the kind of perfect option. So then if we force it up to nine, I'm starting to get a little bit more jittery. I think you can see probably better from the confidence intervals there rather than maybe even the line itself. And then if we force it even higher up to 12, again, it's still fairly jittery. But you'll notice actually that even though that these are much higher and this is twice as high as six, still kind of looks fairly smooth. That's because the penalty is adjusting. So it said before about the penalty trying to pull things tight. So yes, we've put more um, degrees of freedom into it, but then the penalty is up to pull it down. Um, and that's one of the nice things about the GAM. So even it's it's quite robust to miss specification. So if you throw far too many um, degrees of freedom, a really high K into it, for example, you'll probably be all right because it'll pull it flat with the penalty. Um, so that's one of the nice things about this this fitting mechanism is that balance of the penalty versus the number of degrees of freedom is really, really helpful. So yeah, so that's my explanation there is that at lower K, there's not enough functions for it, basis functions for it to flex really. But the, the higher you get, you get to a point where it can describe the data well and anything that is much higher than that will get pulled flat generally by um, the penalty as well. So let's explore the penalty as well. So let's move the penalty around and see what that does. So the idea of the penalty, as I said, is to penalize the, the wiggliness, um, is to, to pull it flatter. So the parameter um, that we want for that um, is actually outside the smooth here. Um, you, can, you can specify them individually in the smooth, but it gets very complicated. So I'm specifying it for the whole uh, penalty. Um, now it's not a, it's not anchored at some sort of reference value that we can understand. It's a kind of relative value as far as I understand it. So knowing that it's 10, 10 watt, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, but, but if I know it starts at 10, I can change it relative, for example. Um, again, this is where the help file would be good. So if I go into GAM, GAM has quite extensive help, as you can see. The thing that I am altering here is SP, so it's smoothing parameters, and you can provide this as a vector. So if you had two, three, four smooths, you could provide a vector of two, three, four penalties. So it's its flexibility makes it hard to learn <laughs> because there's so many options. But we're just going to force three different um, sort of orders of magnitude difference between the smoothing penalty and look at those. So if I run those three, and then again, plot them individually. So starting at 10, so that's with 
the um, the highest smoothing parameter. So then with the lowest smoothing parameter, you see it's not been pulled quite as tight. And then lower again, it's got even more crazy. So if we don't trust the automatic fitting mechanism, thanks Zoe, thanks for your help. Um, if you don't trust the automatic fitting mechanism, you can um, really just rely upon it to to go and, and, and fit on its own. So the higher penalty, as I say, really do um, penalize it quite substantially. And just to kind of illustrate that, I'm going to put the smoothing parameter of a, a million into it here. And that, in theory, should pull it so flat that it's functionally a straight line. So that's kind of the really extreme case. So we did do a little bit of the model diagnostic on the previous one. So I won't labor that too much. Um, I do want to point you at this thing here. So the help file for choose K, which is uh, the sort of rationale for how you choose the, the uh, number of dimensions in the smoother. And uh, it tells you what MGCV does. So if you're interested in it, so you, know, you I would suggest at first, don't at first trust the defaults in case, unless it doesn't work. But as you uh, as you dig into it, it's worth reading through this and seeing about uh, actually how what do I want to set for my data. I'd say most of the time I don't I don't specify it. Most of the time I trust the defaults. I then run a diagnostic, and if any of my smooths um, are don't have enough dimensions, I boost each one of those individually. So again, just to illustrate that, I'll run through this. So. Plotting the cubic regression spine, trusting the, the defaults there. I did my plot like we had before. There's also a couple of nice extra bits in Gratia. So at this point, I've loaded Gratia. So again, Gratia does the same plots. Um, but that's exactly what I showed you earlier. Um, we have GAM check as well, which we looked at on the previous slide, but there are, there are also Gratia and MGCVs kind of equivalents for diagnostics as well. So in Gratia, the, the appraise function gives you the GD plot version of the diagnostic plots. And the check GAM viz, again, you have to use the get viz uh, in MGCVs, does uh, a similar thing as well. So they're just alternative packages and depending on which ones you like, um, they give you the right output. So this gives you the output of GAM check with the plots, but in a, a more ggplot kind of compliant way. And again, there are, you can just use plot as well. You could just kind of straight up plot the, the model. And you can, the, but there is a specific QQ plot within the GAM package as well, which you might also want to use, which is just tailored to deal with the output of GAM. So. That was a lot of stuff there around tweaking the model. So what did we do? So we loaded a default model and then we tweaked it. So we started with very few uh, degrees of freedom basis functions, um, and then we boosted it up higher. So with too few, it pulls the fit straight. Uh, and then when you've allowed enough, it allows it to flex properly. But you hit a certain point where going much higher doesn't do much good because the smoothing parameter or the penalty um, just pulls it flat. So even though we doubled it by the last fit there, it wasn't that much more wiggly because the, the penalty had adjusted. Then we had a little look at the penalty. So we fitted three different orders of magnitude to the penalty and it went from quite smooth to more and more wiggly uh, as the penalty decreased. And also illustrated with a kind of extreme penalty, like in the millions, that it actually just pulled the smoother completely flat as if it was a flat line. And then just like we did on the previous ones, I ran through a couple of the uh, the, the fitting things. But the thing to do is to use the the check gam sorry the, sorry the gam check function, and that will tell you whether or not your smooths have got enough dimensions for them. Okie doke. So I'm going to suggest another short five minute break here um, and then um, I'll take your opinions when we come back on whether you want to do the uh, the last sort of more advanced exercise uh, or whether you'd like to go straight to doing the the, the sort of try it yourself exercise. Um, I shall see you at 25 too. Thanks.
Hello again, everyone. That was a very short break. Um, I hope I'm still screen sharing. Can you see me changing the uh, slides? Sorry, the uh, scripts at the moment. I had pulled the screen sharing. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Brill. So I'll just get back to my slides for a minute. Um, the first time I ran this, this is only the second time I ran this, um, I realized by the time I got to the fourth exercise, I was relying on a couple of extra kind of planks in people's understanding that um, uh, it wasn't clear that the first group actually had. So I wanted to just kind of point them out and then we'll look at them in the script. Uh, and do forgive me if they don't mean loads to you, um, but they're important, I think, if you're trying to use these on anything other than a simple linear model. Um, so I'll just run through these here. So. I'm calling them advanced elements, but it's just to indicate that they're, they're not essential, but they, if you're trying to use them in other contexts, they might be. So I want to just kind of hark back to the name thing that we said earlier. So these are generalized additive models. They're not linear additive models. So you can apply them in the same way that you can apply a generalized linear model. So if you want to do, um, so the examples I've got there, so things like Poisson negative binomial distributions for counts, or you want to use logistic regression for binaries and stuff. Um, these models function exactly the same as a GLM would on that front. Um, so what you need to then add is a family argument. So the family, if you're unfamiliar with GLMs, the family um, tells the model that the response distribution and the, the well, it's actually the error dis distribution of the error term um, is uh, non-normal, is, is Poisson or is um, binomial or, or, or whatever it is you've used. Um, it transforms the fitting through a link function that's associated with that distribution. So in the case of Poisson, um, it's uh, a log function, natural log. Uh, in the case of um, binomial stuff uh, or log logistic regression it's the logic function which is the log odds of the event uh, and these are all kind of standard inside the glm so if you were to, to um, add the uh, argument here for family and specify the distribution so let's imagine here that y is a binary i don't know let's say maybe it's a risk of death or whether or sorry whether or not not risk of death uh, whether or not a patient died yes or no so you could be predicting um, the, the, whether or not a patient died in, on a given data set um, with the addition of this family argument. So that changes the data type, or sorry, the, risk, the, the kind of the, the error distribution and, and the type of response. So um, they're very flexible. They actually have more distributions than the default GLM within R. So if you were to look up, um, I think it's family.gam, in the help files, you get some extra distributions. So you get the Tweedy distribution and some formulations of negative binomial and a few other things. So it actually gives you even more option than um, the GLM. So as I say, the, the step then for changing it into a generalized one is to specify the family argument. Because if you don't, the family argument is silently set to Gaussian in the background, so normal, normal distribution. The trick to remember is that once you're doing a GLM with anything other than normal distribution, um, your model is then functioning on the scale of the link function. So it's functioning on the log odd scale or the, the log of the count or whatever it is, the, the, the scale of the link function. So if you're then predicting out of the model, what you then need to do is to transform the predictions back. Or you need to tell the predict function that the type you want out of it is the response. So it's on the response scale, so the original and transformed scale, not the scale of the link function. So that means that when you do that prediction on your model, give it your new data set, you also need to tell it the type of response to make sure that it gives you the predictions back on the, the natural scale that you want to compare them on. And the second kind of more advanced element is um, interactions. So for any of you who build regression models uh, regularly, I'm sure you probably come across interaction terms. Uh, and I was I was actually struggling for a couple of examples to explain this, if I'm entirely honest. Um, but not every effect that you use as a predictor in a model is truly independent of all the other effects. Um, some of those effects are related. Some of them uh, are sort of correlated and or like confound each other, cloud each other. So there's often a call for certain things to be uh, fitted to a model as both the individual effects, but also the pooled effects together. And that's referred to as an interaction term. So as a couple of examples here, 
Um, for things like the Framingham study, which is a famous um, cardiovascular disease risk study, cohort study from uh, the town of Framingham, um, that established quite a lot of what we know about things like smoking risk and heart, uh, heart disease risk and all sorts. Um, smoking and drinking were factors in that study and in many studies. Um, but actually smoking and drinking effects were not completely exclusive because people often drank and smoked socially in their social time. So they might go to a bar or whatever and they would, they would smoke more and they would drink more. So those two things are actually sort of related. So it wasn't fair to isolate the effect of, of any one individual. Um, and another example might be something like uh, this trial I've got described here. So imagine you have uh, a trial of a, uh, a drug that speeds up recovery from stroke. That might be the effect that you're trying to identify. But actually, the severity of the stroke might cause very different effects. So it might be important to understand that it's not just stroke, it's, it's the interaction of the stroke severity and other things as well. So you might actually need to put that not just as a separate term, but also interact it with things. Um, how that actually works in a GLM is usually you add it with a multiplicative term and the model translates that in this case to uh, Y is predicted by X and Z and the combination of X and Z. Uh, there is another way to do it uh, by using the colon, which means just the interaction and not the separate terms. But I don't think I've ever, in, in my professional life, had, had to use an interaction that didn't include the separate terms as well. But it, but it is possible. Now, I mentioned earlier that these are strictly an additive model framework. So that's a multiplicative thing. So it, it's incompatible. You can't use it. So we can't use a classic interaction term in that way in a GAM. But there are a few ways around it, and actually there's quite a few ways around it. And they involve you creating a multi-dimensional smoother. So rather than just having individual smooths and trying to make them interact in some way, you might create a two-dimensional smooth term that is more like a surface than a spline. We'll have a look at some of that in the slides and see if we can visualize some of it in 3D. But of course, you, you could do that up to many, many terms. And you can actually do that straight up in S right, with a thin plate spline. That works just fine. But there is another specific smoother within MGCV, um, which is based on tensor products. Uh, the idea with that is that that will allow you to um, relate smooths that are on very different scales together, and they won't confuse each other. If you put them both into a single S term, uh, you may have some problems with scaling. Depends on the um, the interaction. But so you have two other options. Um, it's too much to go into the, the ins and outs of either of how they're formulated today, but I will show you some of them in the example as we go in. So I'm going to jip, uh, jump across back again to our studio. And we'll pick up the fourth exercise where we'll run through applying some of those. So again, the first bit is just loading the osteosarcoma data. But if you could run line 27 for me, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pivot the data set now. Um, so we change the way it works. Oh, I have to make sure I've loaded the packages at the top. Um, so the idea is that I now want to make this a long data set where we don't just have uh, male and female rates, we have rate, and then we have another factor of male and female. So that now looks like this. So now my data set resembles that rather than multiple columns of rows. So firstly, I'm gonna have a little quick test for some of the interaction terms. So I want to see whether or not it looks like there's an apparent relationship um, between age and sex by using a linear model, because it's it's kind of the same as a, a test here. So the, the coefficient here is it um, was sex male or not. Um, so it looks like we do have a, so it, it's above our 95% threshold in terms of significance. Um, so it depends on your take on 
significance testing, whether or not that's important. So I'd suggest that you might want to test for it in your final model because it's it's in that sort of realm. But it's not a, it's not a clear definitely is. So then if I try that as an interaction term instead, we can see that actually once I separate out the effects of um, age, sex being male as opposed to female, and then the effects of both age and sex being male, it doesn't appear that either of those are significant. So it's an important step there in the linear model to include that interaction. So how do we then do that in a GAM? Because even, the, even though it wasn't significant, it was important for us to be able to test it. So in a GAM, we will, we're predicting a value and we're smoothing on age and we want to include the categorical variable of sex. So this is without a smoother on it. So if I run that, so it looks like um, sex is significant there. It looks like age is um, significant as a smoother. So remember the linear model, the reason the linear model results might be different is because the linear fit is not as good as the GAM fit. So the GAM fit might actually reveal things in the model that were being clouded because we had a poor fit from fitting a straight line through it before. So now let's include that um, in a different way. So here's one way of doing an interaction here because it's a categorical interaction. So this is saying in my model, I'm going to fit value is predicted by sex, but I'm also going to fit a smoother, but I'm going to fit a, a two versions of the smoother. I'm going to fit a smooth for age um, for each value of sex. So that's what the by argument does here. And again, if you were to look up the help for S, it would explain to you how to use um, the by argument there. So if I run that one, uh, just before we move on from the last one, so my uh, adjusted R square there, 0 0.64, deviance explained 71%. So is this an improvement? So if I look at that, so that's with the smoother for female and smoother for male. Um, looks like, yep, we've got an improvement there and our adjusted R squared has gone up and our deviance explained has gone up. So actually having a separate smooth for male and female in this data set has uh, appeared to give us a better fit. So what does that look like? So if I then try and plot that. So firstly, that is um, age for females. And you'll see here, it's got a hit return for the next plot because actually it's too smooth as it's got to show me. And then that is um, age for males. So they're slightly different smooths. And actually, Emily, I think you were saying before about the difference on um, particularly at the upper age range and the bias of that, I think. So that's that's one way you might handle that difference between the different, group, the different groups. We could also use the VizGam options here to try and do something slightly fancier in 3D. So um, I'm terrible at 3D plots, so forgive me. But this is two different um, angles on the 3D plot of those two smooths. So we've got a male and a female smooth version there, and they're from just different angles of that plot. Uh, it's actually not coded very well because it doesn't tell you what which one's male, which one's female. But um, the idea is that you could try and get the 3D surface being visualized. Okay, and the final thing I wanted to show you after that, so that, that's how we might do an interaction, is doing the generalized linear model stuff. So I'm going to actually change data set here. So I'm using NHSR data sets model, uh, the length of stay model. And this is a data set I created for teaching regression with an interaction. Uh, and I'll explain to you the why. So imagine the context. So this data set is a sort of a pretend version of um, like a hospital inpatient data set where people might be at up to 10 trusts. They've got an age, they've got a length of stay and a value for whether or not they died. So you might imagine that um, B 
being older has an increased risk of death. And you might imagine being in hospital for longer because you have a more severe condition might also have a, an increased risk of death. But what happens if you're both elderly and in hospital for a long time? Is that a function of being elderly or a function of being in the hospital? And which is the risk different? Um, so it's important to compare those two with an interaction term to try and understand it. So firstly, I'm going to plot age there. So you'll see um, the distribution of age. And then the age distribution between the uh, the, the death group. So if we we're looking to predict death, it does look like there's a, a difference between in the average age of the people who died compared to the, the people who did not. And then if we look at the length of stay, the length of stay is actually very skewed, but we do have some very high outliers here. Generally, we've got most people staying only a few days. So that's the groundwork going into it. I'm just checking why I've got two versions of that. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, the length of stay being different between the, um, the the groups of patients who died and who didn't. So now I'm going to build a model to predict uh, the deaths in the patients based on the age and length of stay. So this is a binomial model. So it's a logistic regression. This is a binary. And I've got two predictors here. So this is a GLM, the generalized linear model, not a GAM. But then the GAM version of the same thing might be running the GAM with a smooth on age and a smooth on length of stay. So without going into the diagnostics of anything, firstly, I'm just going to run the AIC there and see if there's a difference between them. So really, there's no difference really between those two models. So there's not really any benefit conferred from, from applying the extra complexity of the smoother. And if I use another metric here, so the, the AUC or the ROC, the area under the receiver uh, operator characteristic curve, um, which you can interpret kind of like you do in R squared, which is just a percentage of variation explained by the model. They both come out really, really similar. So again, if I'm modeling these here, it looks like they've pulled them almost completely flat. So there doesn't appear to be much for the model to, to smooth at all. Uh, I've got a little point here saying that this is fine, but it's worth transforming your plots back onto the, the scale of the, um, the untransformed data where you see they look slightly different. Um, that's given we're short on time, I'm just going to kind of race through the last couple of points here. But skipping down to modeling the data with an interaction. So this is the GLM. If I was to summarize the, um, the GLM with the interaction this time, you actually see that age length of stay and age times length of stay is quite significant. So what is this effect? So the thing that I was alluding to before is that the risk of death when you're elderly in hospital is higher and the risk of death when you've been in the hospital longer, presumably because you have a more severe condition is longer. But elderly people stay in the hospital longer in general, quite apart from whether or not there's a higher risk. So the combination of both long length of stay and being elderly um, would overestimate the risk of death. So the interaction term comes in and you'll see this interaction term is actually negative here. Um, so it blunts it off. So if you're elderly and you have been in for a long amount of time, um, the interaction term sort of blunts that off the extremes of, of both of those coefficients off at the end. And it allows it to estimate that effect a bit better. So what are your options in a GAM then? So you can either use that tensor product that I was talking about on the slides, um, or you can combine things into um, single S terms. And there's a few options explained on the slide here. Now, given we're um, five minutes away from close, I'm going to stop at this point here and just say to you that that is a more advanced set of things. So exercise four here, 
the focus of exercise four is um, understanding how we would do a generalized linear model, uh, sorry, a generalized additive model as opposed to a linear additive model. Um, and then we started looking at how do we look at um, interaction terms and the need for interaction terms. And we can't do interaction terms in a GAM. So what we have to do is we have to do a two dimensional or however many dimensions your interaction is smoother. And we can either do that with S or we can do it with tensor products. So there's a, a lot of different ways to do it. So what you're fitting is a, a surface that represents the interaction rather than a, a multiplicative term that you would in a, a GLM. That's quite a lot. I appreciate that. So I'll park that there. The final exercise here is something that I'd encourage you to do uh, if you can uh, set aside a few minutes. Um, what this does is it picks up the Framingham data set that I was referring to earlier, um, which is uh, all part of this, um, uh, the, the data for this uh, workshop. I've got a list of columns here explaining what the different columns are. And the challenge is uh, for you to build the best model you possibly can um, to predict 10 year CHD risk. So I set out the model shell for you here. So you need a binomial and that's actually wrong, that needs a D. Um, so you can start entering your terms here. So you might um, put uh, total cholesterol in, for example. But what you'll want to do is you'll want to test out your newly acquired GAM skills. So wrap this in S, start looking into it, do your GAM checks, etc., and see how you get on. I've also got um, another version of this exercise with some sort of proposed answers from me and some checks, uh, which you can either just run through and have a look at, or you can try yourself and then benchmark it against mine. Okay, so just to finish up, um, what we've looked at today is we've looked at regression models. So we're concerned with predicting one variable with another. Um, but if you just do a straight linear model, we're assuming that that relationship is completely linear across the whole domain of the relationship of X and Y. Um, and that it, it often isn't, um, either because th there's some quirk of the data or just because that's the real world and it, it doesn't always work so well. Um, it might be that applying a smoother to your data allows you to have a better, more nuanced fit than applying a straight line or just by cutting things into categories. We introduced the spline, which is the sort of mathematical version of a flexible strip that allows you to bend through things, but with enough tension so that it doesn't uh, get too wiggly. The generalized additive model or the GAM is a, a regression context that assumes you can put whatever smooth as you want around your predictors. So it's a, a, it's a, it's a fancy regression. It's a regression with smooth functions. We used MGCV today, which is Simon Wood's uh, fantastic package for fitting GAMs, uh, which has tons and tons of sensible defaults. So the trick is to use the GAM function to wrap your predictors in the S or smoother function uh, and to use the help files judiciously or Simon's brilliant book or any of the courses that are on it. Um, use your GAM check function, which allows you to work out whether or not you have enough knot points or enough degrees of freedom in your smoothers uh, if you have a statistically significant enough resulting GAM check, it means you haven't got enough, so you need to add some more. The exercises we went through showed how you can boost the degrees of freedom, or you can change the smoothing penalty. And the penalty then applies to pull the fit taut. And there's just a few references and stuff on the end there. Uh, all the code for today, uh, we pulled down to use, so you've already got that. Um, I've recommended Simon Wood's book on a few occasions. Uh, I've got the second edition. I don't know if there's a new edition out. Um, it's very, very good. It's probably a bit more mathsy than I am, but it was accessible enough for me. Um, there's loads and loads of R code in it and applications using his own package, um, which make it very accessible. Gnome Ross's course, uh, this is really, really good. This will take you maybe an hour or two at most, but it's all done interactively on the screen with you building models and them explaining it very well. Uh, and the place I actually learned about GAMs and I picked them up originally was from this article by Kim Larson, who worked at the time for Stitch Fix, which is an American clothing company that have a really big data science offering. Because the idea is that 
Um, they match clothes and styles to you through data science, I believe, um, which is fascinating. Um, but that's a great article. Uh, and that took me from never hearing about them to understanding how I might use them in my PhD project, which is the reason I picked them up at the time, because I had very noisy, unhelpful data. And for regression in general, Frank Harrell's book's great. Um, Hasty and Tib Sharani um, have written a generalized additive model uh, book. Originally, I think it was Hasty's um, thesis. And Hasty, Tib Sharani, and um, Jerome Friedman um, have written kind of a, a classic text, if you like. I'm not saying it's a huge page turner because it's statistics, but it's a brilliant, brilliant book with loads and loads of stuff in it called The Elements of Statistical Learning, which covers all sorts of stuff. Uh, and if there was one book to get for the informed statistician data scientist, you know, it's not a beginner book. Um, I would I would recommend that one because it covers so much. Um, brilliant. Right. Well, I'll stop there. Um, I'm going to stop the recording there, but I'll stick around for a little bit uh, and take any questions as well. Thank you so much for your time and your participation. I'm very, very happy to um, take questions from you I'll just drop my email in the chat as well so if you do want to contact me with anything afterwards you're very very welcome brilliant thanks for joining me today